everybody can create money. The point is to get it accepted. There has been competition between private and public ability to issue. But the idea that the origins of money comes from spontaneous creation through trial and error in exchange, you don't see that in historical analysis. It's just a made-up story. What you do see is that you do have some trial and error, but it's trial and error by the state. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard our guest this week, economist and author Professor Eric Tamoyne. And in a moment, we're going to be talking to him about what makes some monetary instruments more instrumental than other monetary instruments. Because as regular listeners will know, our series is all about who's conducting that sweet symphony of monetary instruments. The MMT view is that currency issuing governments like those of the UK, the US, Japan, Canada, Poland, Australia, and many more governments like these, because of the way they spend by changing numbers on a spreadsheet at a central bank, when they spend, they type new currency into existence. And when they tax, they delete previously issued currency out of existence. And you can listen to our episode 126 with Dr. Dirk Entz for more on how the operations of central banks and commercial banks fit together. But as we talked about last week with Professor Assad Zaman, because there are so many moving parts to an economy, so many things you can measure, so many ways you can carve up the results, it's possible to tell any story imaginable with data. So policymakers often start with their desired political outcome, like, say, cutting life-saving public services, and then they can use economic storytelling to find a justification after the fact. As hijacker and communications expert Verbal Kint from the film The Usual Suspects put it, to a cop, the explanation's always simple. If you find a body and you think his brother did it, you're going to find out you're right. And similarly, if you're a conservative think tank and you find inflation and you think welfare spending did it, you're going to find out you're right. That's the joy of economics. You can just pick your favorite story. And so here's one of mine. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. And one day, Mummy Pig, who was absolutely worn out from working two jobs to put her sons through architecture college, said, Boys, since you've graduated, maybe it's time to start thinking about moving out of my basement. And so the three little pigs got to work on building houses of their own. The first little pig, who'd parted his way through college and barely scraped a qualification, built his house out of straw, which predictably fell down at the first gust of wind. The second little pig, who'd also been quite sociable at college and missed quite an important seminar on cantilevers because of a hangover, built a sturdier house out of sticks. But when he went to enjoy the view from the second floor balcony, the house fell down. But the third pig, the clever one who spent a lot of time on the internet, used a cluster of networked computers to build a decentralized virtual house. And it didn't fall down because it didn't exist physically. And Mummy Pig wanted to know what the hell was going on with the electricity bill and why there were sticks and straw all over the garden confronted the three little pigs. And having been brought up to speed about the straw house and the stick house and the house made of nothing, said, Jesus Christ, you guys, what's wrong with a house made out of bricks? Why don't you just make one of those? And the clever little pig explained that Because the puppet governments of the New World Order had been abusing their power to make houses by fiat, there was now a lot of money to be made in decentralized virtual housing in preparation for the Great Reset. A mummy pig said, decentralized virtual houses indeed. We know what a house is. It's a roof being held up by walls made out of bricks. 
we've learned this from painful traumatic experience. I mean, I go so far as to say that calling houses that don't exist houses is a bit misleading. Not to mention my electricity bill. How am I going to pay that off? And the clever little pig said, Mum, it's okay. We just got a huge order from the president himself. And they all got eaten by wolves happily ever after in El Salvador. It's a timeless classic. Just before we dive in, a last reminder that our friend and regular guest, Dr. Dirk Entz, is running a week-long MMT and European macroeconomics course at Maastricht University on the week commencing 22nd of August, and the deadline for applications is the 1st of August, and so I've linked to details about that in the show notes for this episode, along with links to where you can stay current with today's guest, Professor Eric Tamoin, and as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And it's our great pleasure to be joined for the first time by economist and author, Professor Eric Tamoin. Thanks for joining us today, Eric. Hello, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Now, because it's your field of expertise, we really wanted to get into some central banking and conceptions of what money is. And I thought a way in might be to lay out what some people call a hierarchy of money and what other people call moneyness. So would you mind starting by saying what people mean when they talk about a spectrum of moneyness? Yeah. So I think the starting point or the premise is that everybody can create money. And the point is to get it accepted by other people and get it to circulate in the economy. And some economic actors are such that they have the ability to make their money more widely accepted through the economy. And so their moneyness is very high. Okay. And or others, well, they have limited ability to circulate these monetary instruments. And so they have very little moneyness. And so, of course, at the top of the pyramid of monetary instruments, I don't like to use the word money. I prefer to use monetary instruments, like coins, banknotes, and all this, are today usually government national government monetary instruments that circulate very widely. And then you move down the pyramid, you have a bank monetary instruments. And then if you move down further, you'll have local currencies. Okay. And you can move even down. Maybe some local communities, very tiny communities can use their own monetary instruments. Okay. And you can go down further even from that. And so the wider the area of circulation, the wider it is accepted, and so the more moneyness it has. How related is that to the concept of liquidity? And maybe do you have a kind of an official definition for liquidity or how liquid money is? Sure. So to get to that, we have to understand uh, first the legal system within which we operate today in a capitalist economy. We operate under a framework called nominalism. And under that framework, legal contracts, debt contracts, are nominal contracts. What that means is that the debtor is only indebted in terms of the nominal value of the contract. So, for example, if, Christian, I borrowed $1,000 from you and $1,000 today buys a 100 chocolate croissant and I'll repay you in 10 years and in 10 years, $1,000 buys only 10 chocolate croissants. Okay. Well, the question that has come throughout history is, should I compensate you for the loss of purchasing power? So that when I repay you, I owe you as principles a hundred chocolate croissants. So what matters is not 
the thousand dollars, what matters is the quantity of goods that I can buy with that thousand dollars. And that's what debtors really owe a quantity of goods, not a nominal sum. So there have been some legal debates regarding that. And early on in、uh, European history, countries have. Provided different answers to that. Also, in periods of hyperinflation, you have had a return of these kinds of questions. But overall, since the 18th to 19th century, in most countries, the answer has been that what matters is a nominal sum, the thousand dollars, not the number of chocolate croissants we can buy with that thousand dollars. And so the debtor only owes the nominal sum, and the creditor has to take upon himself or herself. The inflation risk. And of course, the debtor has to take on himself or herself the deflation risk too. Okay. Because if you follow the argument in terms of deflation, of course, that would mean that the debtor would owe less money. Okay. Because then you can buy more chocolate croissant with less money. So that would work both ways if you follow the view that the quantity of goods m a t t e r Okay, but we have moved away from that. It's just the nominal sum that matters. And so all contracts today are usually nominal contracts from taxes to debt service to bond payments. They're all nominal sums. And so what that means is that for the solvency and liquidity of an economic unit, nominal sums are extremely important. Okay, that's what determines your credit worthiness. So, with that in mind, then liquidity means having a constant nominal value. That would be perfect liquidity. It、okay. doesn't mean that the purchasing power is constant, it usually is not. And over the past century, purchasing power has been declining almost constantly. But it means that you have a nominal value that is constant, and that is important in and on itself because it allows you to reliably pay those dues that are set in nominal terms. And would you say the thing that keeps the nominal value constant in modern money systems is the charterist view that it's taxation that drives money? Yeah. So if you go back through history, it has taken a long time, first of all, to debate about what the proper way to define what is owed is. And so you have a debate between what we'll call the metalists and the nominalists, and then you have debates between the valorists and the nominalists too. So, how we set the nominal value, once we agree on nominal value being important, there is again a long Period in monetary history to try to figure out how to do that well. So, you have basically three phases in the life of a monetary instrument. One is the injection phase, when it's put into circulation. Then you have the circulation phase. And then you have a third one, which is redemption, when it's taken out of circulation. And these three phases require specific. Settings so that the monetary instrument will work at par all the time. So, chartalists have emphasized the redemption phase, the idea that you have to put in place a means for a monetary instrument to be redeemed by whomever h o l d them. But there is more to it. At the injection phase, you also need to have specific requirements and during the circulation phase, too. So, if you want, we can go through all of that. So, I'll take an example with, let's say, we issue、uh, Eric t i m o i n e s notes. Okay. And the unit of account is going to be trees. Okay. Whatever. So, my、uh, bank note is、uh, 20 trees. Okay. That's the,、uh, how much worth it is in terms of the tree unit of account. And I have the 20 tree、uh, node, the 10 tree node, I have coins in trees. Okay, that's the name of the unit of account. It doesn't promise any actual trees, it's just the name we gave to the unit of account. And the first thing you have to do when you inject is make sure that you inject what people want to use in the economy. So, If you go back in history, it used to be like the mint, for example, would not issue enough 
of some specific coins that were in high demand in the economy because it was not profitable to do that. And also it used to be the case that the government would spend only very irregularly for war mostly because of the king wanted to go in war. Okay. And if I start to spend like this very irregularly and not paying attention to what the needs of the economy is in terms of the monetary instruments I issue, I'm going to start to have troubles down the road and we'll come back to visit that. So you have to have to make sure that you have an elastic supply of your monetary instruments. In the injection phase, you have to make sure you accommodate the needs of the economy, not only in terms of the overall amount needed, but also in terms of the structure of the monetary instruments you issue. So maybe most people want the two trees coin. Okay, they like this one a lot. So I have gonna have to issue more of those. Maybe people don't use that much a hundred trees note. So I won't issue that much of that. So you just issue according to what is needed. And you issue that at face value. That is, you issue that as the value that is stamped or printed on the note or on the coin. So how do I issue? Practically, I'm going to buy things from people in the economy. So I'll buy a computers and a computer is worth a thousand trees. So I'll give you a thousand trees. How do I do that? Well, if I issue coins, I stamp them on metal. If I issue notes, I'll print on papers. If it's electronic, I'll just key strike a number on a computer. The form doesn't matter. The point is that you have your issuing monetary instruments and you issue that at the value that is inscribed on the notes. Okay. Uh, when I issue a 20 trees note, I don't say, well, this is worth 10 trees. No, I say it's worth 20. Okay. So I issue that at 20. So I signal to people by buying things from them or by providing credit to them that it's worth 20 trees. And then when it's circulating in the economy, I have to also keep reminding people, especially earlier when means of communications were not that great, take medieval times, you have to keep reminding people that, well, this thing is worth 20 trees, especially so that, uh, again, if you go back to medieval time or Renaissance time, even the number was not sometimes inscribed on the coins. So uh, people had to be reminded what that was worth. So you have to have an efficient communication system to make that happen. And last, people have to be able to redeem these instruments that I have issued. Otherwise, they wonder why they would accept them in the first place. And so here you have, again, several ways to do that at issuance. I can make several promises to people uh, regarding what you can do with this instrument. Okay, the first one would be, for example, uh, I promise that if you give me back the 20 trees note, in exchange, I'll give you gold. Okay, well, people may say, well, um, am I confident that Eric has gold in his house or in the bank that he will be able to give to me whenever I come and try to redeem the 23 note. Okay. And I say for each 23 notes, you can get one ounce of gold. Okay. So that's one way you can redeem. Okay. Redeem means returning to the issuer. So returning to me. Another way you can redeem is by making people pay dues to you. So at the issuance, you say to people, okay, I'll pay you with this 20 trees note. And why would you accept it? Well, because I'm also imposing on you a tax and you can pay the tax with this 20 tree notes. And I will accept the 20 tree notes at 20 trees, not at 15 trees. I'll take it back at 20 trees. So you can pay 20 trees worth of tax debt you owe me with that note. So if you owe me a hundred trees of taxes, well, you have to give me five 20 trees note. Okay. So again, there, that's a promise I make. 
And to enforce that promise, I have to uh, redeem them by enforcing the tax payment. And so you have to have effective enforcement mechanisms for that. You have to make sure that you record properly who owes tax. You have to have efficient collection mechanisms so that people can't evade taxes. You have to make sure that the tax collectors are not corrupt so that they do their job correctly. And so you have all sorts of things that have to be in place. And so all these three phases really need a lot of things to go right. You have to think of them properly, what the the requirements are for each phase. And it took a long time for that to happen throughout monetary history for that to happen. And if you do all those three phases right, then when the instruments circulate, it will circulate at 20 trees. Okay. If you don't do those things properly, when it circulates, it might not circulate at 20 trees. It might circulate at less than 20 trees, or it might circulate at more than 20 trees. So to take again some historical example to bring it back to Earth, I guess, if you look at coins or bank notes in the past, okay, it was not necessarily the case that it would circulate at the value stamped on the coin or at the value printed on the bank note, okay? If you go to a store with a $20 note, okay, the merchant will say, oh, well, will, would say, oh, well, this $20 note, I'll only take it for 10, okay? Or he would say, oh, well, this one, I'll take it for 25, okay? Even though it's a 20, okay? And so when it's circulated, these instruments do not necessarily circulate at their face value. They may have circulated at a premium or at a discount. Okay. And so put in some order into the monetary system to make sure that the bearers pass to each other the note at 20 all the time. Okay. This took some time to figure out properly how to do that. And many errors sometime the uh, governments or banks forgot to include their redemption clause, so they never redeemed their uh, monetary instruments, or if they did, they didn't do it properly, or they, again, in the injection phase, they didn't issue the proper monetary instruments, so when redemption had to come, people didn't have the means to pay the tax, okay? So they had to scramble, and they were willing to pay more for specific coins that were in short supply so that they could pay the tax and avoid going to prison. So you have all kinds of things that need to come right for that to work properly. So I want to get into this redemption idea in a minute, but just to bring it home, earlier you were talking about on the spectrum of moneyness or the hierarchy of money. You said at the top you've got... I guess, central bank money, government money, and then commercial bank money. And then you talked about local currencies and community currencies below that. Can you give me some examples of that? Just to ram it home, you know, what kind of money things are at either end of this spectrum of moneyness? Well, recently I just reviewed a paper that is talking about local currency issued in the uh, south of France, the USCO, E-U-S-K-O. So it's a local currency issued in the south of France through uh, the city of Bayonne, okay? It's in the Basque country. And so they have issued those things and the papers ran through basically the legal challenges that the city of Bayonne has faced with the uh, national government. And so we ran through that. Is this in circulation right now, Eric? Yeah. It's exchangeable, partly convertible into euros. Okay, there are restrictions in there. So they're working through the process of establishing the proper mechanism for the three phases of uh, life of a monetary instrument. So there is this one. If you go to the United States, again, there are several of them that exist, and I'm, I'm sure throughout the world, and maybe in, probably even in England, there must be some local currencies issued at the, the level of a city or uh, even a village, things like that. So you recently had a back and forth with George Selgin 
of the Cato Institute, who said on Twitter, neither reserve balances nor Federal Reserve notes are redeemable claims to any of the Federal Reserve's assets. So that's his quote. So I guess that's what's wrong with fiat currency as he and many people aligned with him see it, that you can't get anything for the currency the federal government issues when you hand it back to them. I guess it's just a, he kind of uses a very wordy way of saying we're not on the gold standard anymore. That's what it seemed to me as a bystander. But what do you say to that? What I say, it's a narrow understanding of what redeemable means. Mm. Okay. Redeemable really means you have the ability to return to the issuer whatever it is that that issuer issued. So you can extend that to a, a free pizza coupon okay, that you receive in the mail. Okay. Well, you can go redeem it and get a pizza for it. Okay. So that thing is convertible into a free pizza. Okay. Any tickets you have, you go to the movie theater, you exchange that to convertible into an actual movie watching night or day, whatever, whenever you go. So uh, redeeming may mean getting something in exchange, either a service or an actual good, but it doesn't have to be like that. Again, you can return to the issuer, whatever it is, a ticket or a banknote or whatever, just because you owe to the issuer some money. Okay, why do you owe some money? Well, maybe the state said, well, you owe me and that's it. So pay me or you go to prison. Okay, or in the past, if it's the king, is I cut your hand or kill you, whatever. So you owe me money. And uh, why? Because I said so. Okay, that's one way. Okay, you force people to be indebted to you. Another way is people may willingly get indebted to you, uh, the issuer of monetary instrument. That's the case of banks. Okay, people willingly go to banks and say, well, can I uh, get a financing to buy a house? So you provide me the money, and in exchange, I give you my own IOU, and I'll pay you over the next decade or, or more, and I'll pay, I promise I'll pay you interest. So it's people are willingly indebted. So now you owe the bank, okay, or you owe the state. Okay. And how can you redeem yourself? Okay. That is absorb yourself from the debt. Uh, one way. Okay. Is to give back to the bank or give back to the state the monetary instrument they issued. Okay. So if you owed a uh, hundred dollars of tax to the state, well, you can give five $20 notes and that's it. You have paid your taxes, you have redeemed the tax you owe, and the state who had promised to accept those $20 notes as payments also has redeemed itself. So that's another way you can redeem a monetary instrument, by paying what is owed to the monetary instrument issuer. Okay. And there is a tight connection between the ability to issue monetary instruments um the ability to impose either willingly or forcefully debt on others and how widely a monetary instrument circulates. So the pyramid that we have been talking about in the beginning of the show and that shows at the top the most widely accepted monetary instruments and below that you have banks and below that you have others what you see is this is tightly connected to the number of debtors that an issuer has. So the state is by far having the widest number of debtors because it imposes on everyone in the country, or almost everyone in the country, a tax debt. Or if there is no, not something called taxes, it's another thing. It's a due of some kind of fine, fees, whatever. And it has the discretion to impose that on the space over which the state has sovereignty. And so given that, you also have a very uh, wide circulation of the monetary instrument that the state issues. Then below that, you have banks also have a large number of people and firms and other economic agents indebted to them. And they promise that they will accept the monetary instrument they issue, the bank accounts. They will accept that as means of payments of debt owed to them. 
And so that makes these monetary instruments widely accepted. And the further you go down the line, or the pyramid, I guess, the lower the ability to impose or to make other willingly indebted to you is. And so the narrower the space of circulation is going to be. At some point, you might not be able to impose any debt. So the only alternative is to make a promise to convert into something else. And conversion is another way to redeem, as we say, and can work concurrently with the promise that you can pay debt owed to the issuer. But as you move down the line and the ability to impose debt on others dwindles, conversion becomes the only real mean you can do that. Well, I was just retweeting a tweet that you said a while back, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And it was, if I may quote, you said of a video about Bitcoin is asking for the separation about the separation of money from the state. And you replied by saying, this is a crew of the problem with Bitcoiners. They want to separate governance from monetary systems and they conceptualize a fair, ideal monetary system as something purely mechanical that operates independently of human aspirations. Several issues with this. What are the issues with this? So again, if you ask yourself, well, why do we have monetary system? Where do they come from? Okay. What you see is that monetary systems don't emerge randomly. Okay. The first modern versions of monetary systems were put in place by religious authorities uh, in Mesopotamia and Egypt with the goal of channeling resources toward these religious authorities. So those were uh, agrarian uh, societies so uh, what they wanted to channel toward the religious authorities, okay, we call that the state, that's not, it's kind of an anachronism, but let's say a government, they wanted to channel grains. They also wanted to channel labor to them. So we want to build pyramids. Okay, well, we're going to have to have people come in. And so you can have slaves if you want. Uh, you can also uh, pay people to help do those things. So the point is you use a monetary system to channel resources toward what you see is the public purpose. And so what the public purpose is in this case defined very narrowly as uh, whatever the kings decide the public purpose is. Okay. And as you move through time, the way we have defined uh, or established monetary systems also has reflected the methods of governance of a country. So we have allowed private issuance, okay, we have delegated some of the issuance to banks, for example, okay, because we saw, we think that having some decentralized a decision-making process regarding how to allocate resources is good, okay? And so we have allowed others to do that, okay? And there has been, of course, competition between those private ability to issue and the public ability to issue, and it's a contested area. But the point is, the monetary system does not exist in a vacuum as something that is out there operating on its own. It's there to basically make the economy run smoothly, okay, or help it to run smoothly, to help direct the allocation, direct the production, direct distribution of resources. So you can't have something that is supposed to work as money that is completely disconnected from whatever the needs of the system is. Again, we have talked about that, these three phases, the injection, circulation, and redemption phases, all of them require involvement by the issuer to make sure that the system works properly because you have to make sure that you accommodate the needs of the economy. You have to make sure that you have proper information that is disseminated. You have to make sure that redemption channels work correctly. So this idea that you can set up a monetary instrument such as Bitcoin that issues, I don't like to call that money, but issue things that are issued and uh, basically in uh, like a robot okay that's a computer that determines how much is issued and over a, 
uh, how many periods of time. So every 10 minutes, okay, you have a new amount that is created. This amount is decreasing over time, okay? And so the question you may have is, well, why is it every 10 minutes? Who gets to decide why we have a certain amount every 10 minutes? Do we need that much? Is that enough? Okay. All that should be managed, the injection. And of course, there is no means to redeem Bitcoins. They're supposed to be out there forever. And again, so you're failing on the injection phase, you're failing on the redemption phase. And so that makes for something that is highly volatile. And it makes for something that doesn't accommodate the needs of the economy properly. And so that is a poor mean to govern the economy, either, again, through government or through private agents, if you want to work that way. How linked is this to the idea of an authority? Because obviously fiat currency, as you mentioned, uh, was born out of an authority initially religious trying to mobilize resources in its favor. And MMTs tend to emphasize the need to make that authority as accountable as possible so that it actually acts in everybody's interest. But Bitcoiners are quite keen on basically removing authority from its relationship with money and to make money a decentralized thing. Can a world where money is not controlled by any one authority actually exist? You have but it depends on how you define authority. If you uh, mean, uh, is there a possibility for an issuer-less monetary instrument? No, uh, that doesn't exist. Now, that authority can be a government, but you may have a private authority that has a wide range uh, or wide space over which it has a say or knows a lot of people. And so that will also help the instrument to circulate more widely. The point is you need an issuer that actively manages the thing it issues. Okay, It can't be a computer that decides randomly uh, how much to issue regardless of the needs of the economy. And it can be something that is irredeemable. Okay, the bitcoins are completely redeemable. You cannot, meaning again, there is no issue or you can go back to and ask to exchange that for something like a dollar or gold or anything to uh, the computer that issued bitcoins. Okay, I think what the bitcoin crowd wants is to have a monetary system in which an issuer does not impose either willingly by debtors or forcefully on debtors any debt on anyone. Okay. It just wants something that circulates as pure asset and that is convertible into something else. And, and that's where they want to go, I think. So that's a challenge they have. Is it fair to say that applying the credit theory of money, like money is always credit, of some description or other. And in order for that to work, it has to be a promise, a promise to do something. And in the case of a national currency, a fiat currency, what the issuer is saying is, let's say it's the UK, we promise that this five pound note will pay down five pounds worth of your debt to the state, your liability. It could be a tax liability, it could be fees, fines. Whereas units of cryptocurrency are not a promise to do anything. They are a statement of fact that, okay, it's a proof of work. I mean, Warren Mosler says, what is a Bitcoin? It's a certificate that says you solve the puzzle. And so, and obviously this is appealing to libertarians in that, okay, a computer did some work. <laughs> That's what it says. Okay. And people are going okay, well, we agree that this is worth something. But obviously, we see the price going up and down all the time. And it's like, well, obviously, people from day to day, minute to minute, do agree it's worth something that it's not, and that it's worth way less, that it's worth way more. So that's the problem with it, basically. Yeah, that's right. Because you have, again, no valuation anchor provided by the issuer. Again, as we went through the different phase here, we saw that each time, at each phase, the issuer specifically stated what the nominal value of its monetary instrument is. So uh, the 20 trees note, I issued it at 20 trees. 
when it was circulating, I told everyone, this is worth 20 trees. And when I redeemed it, I said, I'll take it at 20 trees. So you have an anchor that is provided to the nominal value. Now, if you uh, look at Bitcoins, the computer decided that one Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin. Okay. And impose that. So the way the fluctuation is going to come is through the exchange rate with other currency. If you go back in time, again, through monetary history, the fluctuation, again, usually came from, say, to take Bitcoins, it would have been a one Bitcoin that would circulate at 0.5 Bitcoin. And uh, another time it would circulate at two Bitcoins. Okay. So during the circulation phase, people would exchange the monetary instrument, not necessarily at its face value. It could be above or below because you didn't have proper anchoring of the value of the monetary instrument by the issuer. Why? Again, because either it failed at the injection phase to properly provide whatever was needed in terms of the amount and structure of the monetary instrument or during the circulation phase, it didn't properly announce or explain what the value was, or during the redemption phase, it didn't redeem the phase value or didn't redeem at all. So all these different phases, you need to have uh, some anchor provided by the issuer, and basically Bitcoin fails everywhere. And just going back to maybe the political culture or the ideology behind people that advocate Bitcoin, like you said in that tweet that Patricia talked about, that it's totally understandable. And it's a typical idea that's held by cryptocurrency advocates that governments have taken over monetary systems. And that's where our challenges to liberty and the consequences such as imperialism and authoritarianism, that's where it all comes from. So in their worldview, if we could just divorce politics from money and get money back to what many libertarians would characterize as the original form of money, which is just somehow an organically arising agreed upon store of value. If we could just get back to that, the world would be back to being a fair place. But again, I mean, you know, there's lots to say about that. But part of it is that's never been what money is as far as anybody knows, right? Right. The idea that the origins of money comes from spontaneous creation through trial and error in exchange. And so bit by bit, people uh, figure out that, oh, this thing is uh, a bit better medium of exchange. And oh, well, actually, it turns out this is better. And then progressively, we converge toward uh, gold and silver as the best medium of exchange. This story basically has, uh, you don't see that in historical analysis. It's just a made up story. Okay. And what you do see is that you do have some trial and error that is going on, but it's trial and error by the state. Okay. Lots of mistakes, lots of trying things and, oh, it works. And now we have to figure out where, where, hold it. Why did it work? What did we do right? So you have some trial and error, but it's not coming from market exchange and trying to figure out what is a proper medium, but more an authority trying to channel resources toward itself and trying to find the best way to do that and stumbling upon solutions and figuring out, oh, it looks like this works better, so we'll do it that way. Or we'll try this, oh, this failed miserably. Well, let's try something else. Another thing, I believe it was a comedian that was speaking about Bitcoin and the separation of money and the state. And it was comedian Dave Smith. And he gave an example. Can I just say comedians should just stay the hell out of this? I know. They shouldn't do economics, really. That's Absolutely. my view. <laughs> so this comedian, he is making the point that imagine if governments couldn't print money, then the government would have had to actually get the people to fund the Iraq war. And therefore, it may have not happened or it may not have lasted as long as it did. <laughs> the clip is wrong on so many levels, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But this bit is important because that's sort of the mentality of the gold standard. that. Effectively, you put the government in a position where basically you gave it bond vigilantes, which meant that for every policy, the government has to please those people who have the most available funds for savings. And therefore, I think that kind of attitude may actually make the government not accountable to people as a whole. 
but to people who have the most funds to give to the government. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So the idea of the pay force, basically, you can see that it's actually widely shared of a view today in the world among policymakers, except in times of emergencies like war or COVID recently. Suddenly, we seem to be able to fund whatever is needed to be funded very quickly. But if you start to look at more routine policy debates about uh, shall we have a Green New Deal? Shall we expand Medicare? I guess you don't have this problem in the UK. We'll have it pretty soon. The Conservatives <laughs> yeah. doing a pretty good job of uh, pushing us in that direction. <laughs> That's true. But so, yeah, the issue becomes, oh, um, do we have the money? And how are we going to find the money for that? And we need to raise taxes for that to work properly. and Or we have to lower spending somewhere else. Okay. And what modern money theory has been pretty good at is showing that this way of framing the issue and evaluating policy proposal is incorrect once you have a monetary sovereignty. The issue of finding the money is really not what you are after. Okay, that's pretty easy to find. Okay, we're just typing numbers on the computer here. But what is important is to figure out, do we have the resources available to do whatever we want to do? So take, for example, Medicare, okay, or the fact that we have an aging society and we're going to have to have infrastructures that uh, allow a better uh, standard of living for an aging society. Do we have the actual number of workers, do we have enough concrete, do we have enough any other raw material needed to uh, basically meet the needs of an aging society? Okay, so can we produce enough food? Can we produce enough uh, healthcare services? So those are relevant questions to ask. And definitely here, there are some tricky questions. Okay, Uh, what we see is that the ratio of non-worker to workers rising okay and so you have less workers available to take care of a growing number of non-workers okay that's a, a major problem what we call the dependency ratio okay so how do you deal with that well putting money in a trust fund or saving money uh in somewhere doesn't do anything what you need to do to solve that problem is find ways to raise the productivity of workers have a well-defined immigration policy find technology that helps you to take care of an elderly population so all these are issues indeed you have to train more healthcare workers so how do you do that how do you incentivize people to go in those fields so all of these are important questions and Finding the resources to do that might be tricky, okay? But these are completely different questions than can we find the money? Finding the money is easy. So at the moment, we're seeing the value of Bitcoin still, obviously it fluctuates a lot, but it is far more, I think we'd agree, than most people thought that it would be at any one point in relation to the dollar. And my understanding of that is that the value going up is being driven primarily by simply the fervor of people who believe that Bitcoin is something far more significant than what it actually is. And I wanted to know what you thought of that and whether you had perhaps any ideas as to, I don't think any of us can predict exactly, you know, the timeline of events, but I thought perhaps if you could give your view on what the mechanisms might be for Bitcoin either losing its value or simply, you know, we going back to a place where Bitcoin is worth nothing as it was in the beginning. So this idea that it depends on the fervor of people Maybe, but I think if you look at the uh, structure of ownership of Bitcoins, a lot of it is highly concentrated in a few hands. And so there must be a lot of price manipulation here and through different means, hyping the Bitcoins, okay, or manipulating price in other ways also. Uh, there. So, yeah, the, what they're trying to do here, the key holders of Bitcoins, is boost up the willingness to hold those things and get more people to participate. And if you have legislations that allow uh, institutional investors to 
get bitcoins that will boost the demand for sure. So you can try to work through Congress to expand the demand for those things. Okay, and that will help to boost the price for sure. But ultimately, again, this thing has no value anchor. Okay, and so again, it's going to go up and down and it's going to go back down to zero if basically people give up. And so one of the way you want to avoid that is by keeping up the hype and saying this is the next big thing and uh, you should keep holding on to these things. We're in there for the long haul. Don't pay attention to short-term fluctuations. It's basically a Ponzi game we have here. So uh, again, if you move away from Bitcoins into other areas, the crypto uh, environment has developed quite a bit away from Bitcoins. And so you have... Well, I think from my viewpoint, one of the interesting development is the issue of stable coins. Okay. And that again brings back a lot of things that were tried in the past. Okay. And we're repeating the same mistakes as we did in the past. And I'm pretty sure we're going to go down the road finding the similar solutions. So we have Luna that crashed recently. Okay, and you have a bunch of other stable coins that are supposed to guarantee par convertibility one to one. Problem is, you have the assets that are backing the coins are not necessarily li very liquid, so that if you have people coming to redeem and the issuer, say Luna, has to find a way, so people come with one Luna coin and they want one dollar. Okay, well, you have to find that dollar somehow. If you don't have it on your balance sheet, then you have to sell an asset. Uh, hopefully, you have very liquid assets, okay, so that you can sell them very quickly for almost their full values. And then you can basically give to the uh, bearers, so the Lunas, the dollars they wanted. And so this issue of having the uh, liquid enough assets to fulfill the redemption demands of the bearers is something that goes back in time with private banks, with public banks. Each time we have this issue of promise of conversion, well, people are going to test that and make sure that you can actually redeem. And what we find throughout history is that, oh, turns out <laughs> you can't convert as easily as you thought you could. And so things crash. Okay, and so basically, how did we solve that problem? ultimately is by guaranteeing conversion through the state. Okay, that's what happened with banks. Okay, we have FDIC insurance, you have par clearing of different banks' money through the state. And so we probably, if if this experiment persists, okay, we're going to again stumble and stumble and stumble. And if it takes off and uh, stable coins become something that people use, we probably are going to have to have some state guarantee. And the state is busy already at doing that. Many states are busy at trying to uh, create their own stable coins too. Okay. So this development where they've worked really, really hard and developed this thing called cryptocurrency, and it's a net financial asset that's convertible one-to-one -one with the US dollar. We've already got one of those, right? Anyway, so I think what you're saying, Eric, is that things will change if the government get involved. If the government go, okay, we are now backing stable coins. Because to me, an issuer of something, a net financial asset that is guaranteed convertible one for one to, say, a dollar or a pound, unless the government's involved, I can't see how that's not fraud. Well, again, you remember, everyone can issue a monetary instrument. Okay. Tomorrow I can start issue my uh, twenty trees note. Yeah. Okay. Can I make good on my promise? That's the problem. The thing that if I heard you right, because you know, as the cryptocurrency world grows in popularity, I read some reports about there being fears that people are not understanding what the risks are, and therefore is embedding itself directly or indirectly into the financial system. And so you add instability to the whole system that way. So what I understand from what you're saying is that that situation, if it becomes extreme, then that may 
not force, but encourage governments perhaps to um, to provide guarantees on the cryptocurrencies and to therefore give them more credibility. Because ultimately, if people start using those things, okay, because they find it convenient, uh, more convenient than using cash, okay, you're going to have to have basically the government coming in and help. And again, you go back through history, you have this back and forth between uh, government and private sector, and it's a contested area of governance. And uh, you have governments that have taken uh, innovations of the private sector for themselves, Okay, and says we're going to do it on our own. Or sometimes they have accepted what, what the innovations of the private sectors are and say, okay, we'll help you because ultimately it's good for the financial stability of the economy, given how widely this monetary instrument is used and how widely the financial practice that you have invented is used. And we see it as a positive for governments of the economy. So we'll help. So, yeah. And again, if you go back through history, you have this idea of contested authority and uh, willingness to challenge the state in terms of authority and decide, nope, I want to issue my own monetary instrument. I want to do it my own way. I don't want to be dependent on the state. We have merchants have been doing that for a long time. And this contested areas of governments are not new. So moving on to central bank digital currencies, which are at various stages of planning and implementation in various parts of the world, in terms of this, how should we conceive them? I have not followed very carefully the literature, but from what I have read is you have basically two different ways to go. One is we're going to allow uh, you and I to have an account at the central bank, and the other one is we're going to have to have some form of equivalent of a bank note, but in electronic form. Okay. And so those are the two ways they're going, I think. So there are debates on the pros and cons of all of them and uh, how we should do this. Ultimately, I don't think it's going to change much. First of all, it's quite different from what the, the Bitcoiners had in mind because it's just going to be a centralized creation. It's not going to be random. It's going to be managed. So we're moving quite far away from what the Bitcoin creators have in mind. That's how I conceive it, that you're going to have an account directly at the central bank. At the moment, we have to bank at commercial banks and the commercial banks bank at the central bank. To me, it seems like it's not a bad idea to cut out the middleman. <laughs> Just on a very basic level, that why do we need the commercial bank in the way? Commercial bank has a reserve account at a central bank and therefore commercial banks reserve balance at the central bank is a numerical entry on that central bank spreadsheet with a dollar sign next to it or a pound sign next to it. A unit of central bank digital currency, kind of the same, right? Yeah, the, I think the if you go the route of having people having accounts at the central bank, yes, the, the main challenge here is that banks are going to complain. The idea that the payment service they provide today is quite lucrative to them. So they want to keep that business. But if you uh, allow the central bank to uh, have everyone have an account there and the central bank make payments on behalf of people and moving funds between accounts. I think a lot of people would prefer to have an account there. They would feel it's safer, although technically it's not really because you have all these government guarantees that exist already, but maybe people would feel safer to have an account there. And so uh, with that, banks would lose a lot of business. I would not be happy. <laughs> so I, all it seems to me is that the story is being framed as digital currencies are this new innovative thing that's come along, shaking up the world of finance and now central banks want to get in on the act. So we need to be on our guard because central banks are evil. But firstly, I just I can't see what's innovative about digital currencies in the first place. <laughs> the idea that central banks might get involved in the monetary system <laughs> again goes back to everything we've been talking about you know it's when we understand what money as we know it actually is which is a government policy tool again can't see how the world has changed by central bank digital currencies myself yeah well i think when the the main plus of all this crypto development it has is that it has challenged 
banks and other financial institutions involved in payments to up their game in terms of the payment system. Because uh, some of these cryptocurrencies allow you to transfer funds across the world at a low cost. But again, you have had a response like, Western unions and maybe not Western Union, but others that have responded and have provided a service of transferring funds all over the world at quite low cost and very quickly too. That's the main positive I have seen from all that story at the moment. And that's it. Yeah, that's usually the one that is promoted by proponents of Bitcoin saying that, well, what if you live in Venezuela or Ukraine, where basically things are falling apart, well, at least you can rely on Bitcoins to make and receive payments and you're not starved to death. Again, I think financial institutions have caught up on that and have improved their game on this. I think that's a great place to leave it. We've been talking to economist and author, Professor Eric Tamoyne, and we'll link to where you can stay up to date with Eric's work in the show notes for this episode. But for now, thanks again for joining us today on the MMT podcast, Professor Eric Tamoyne. Thank you for having me. That was great. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.